I want to make our Bible confession and then kind of get into what the Lord has. I'm telling you, a lot of warfare over this word here this morning. I'm telling you, I, for the last couple of days, I've got, um, believe it or not, I have got 26 pages of notes. <laughs> Some of you are going, oh no, <laughs> this is going to be a long one. No, never fear. <clears throat> I mean, God was just pouring out revelation in my heart over the last few days. And I was trying to keep up with it, and I was trying to make it fit, you know, where it fits so that it made sense. And God, you know how God gives you stuff. He doesn't always give it to you in, in outline form, you know. And so he gives you parts and pieces. And I'll tell you, by the time last night came, I threw up my hands and I said, Lord, I don't know what to do with this. And so I closed my iPad and watched a movie, <laughs> you know, called Eric and said, hey, <laughs> be prepared. I don't know what we're doing here today. And uh, I got up this morning and, you know, morning is always a special time for me because it's a time where my spirit is more open. It's more refreshed. It's more in tune, I guess, with the presence of God and, um, I was able to reduce, praise God, I was able to reduce my message to six pages. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, the substance of what I want to share is, is what's important. <clears throat> and I want to, I want to make this uh, confession this morning because I believe this sets our hearts to be able to hear what God wants to say. Amen. So I can't bring it up here. I think I, I should know this. I wrote it. But um, let's make this confession together. The Bible is God's holy inspired word to me. It's the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Therefore, I confess that I am who the word says I am. I have what the word says I have, and I can do what the word says I can do. Holy Spirit, open my heart today. Pause. Let's say that again. Holy Spirit, open my heart today. One more time. Holy Spirit, open my heart today so that I can receive what you're saying to me. Let your word transform my life so that I reflect the love of Jesus every day in every way in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, ah, gosh, where do I start? How many of you have been blessed this morning already? I mean, the presence of the Lord is, is awesome. Uh, I love being able to, to kind of have extended time to just kind of break in and worship. I'm telling you, we're going to have some services that I think the entire service is going to be nothing but worship. Y'all okay with that? You go some places and worship is preliminary. It is not preliminary in the kingdom. Amen. And it's more than a song. Worship is considering him of greater worth and value than anything that is going on in the world. Amen. His presence is more valuable than anything I have to say. I can promise you that. But... If he's giving me something to say, we want to have ears to hear what that is. Amen. Amen. And I pray the Lord to anoint me to be able to share this in a way that um, brings glory to him. We just had communion. And I, I, want to, um, I want to put this in the context because what I want to talk about today, I, I want to talk about two covenants. All right. Or I don't want to talk. I want to talk about two gospels. All right. Because... In the day in which we live, there's, there's kind of two gospels that are being preached. There's the gospel of the covenant of Jesus, and there's the gospel of the kingdom. And they're two different things. And I didn't see that. I didn't see that until just a couple of days ago. And so I began to, the Lord, as he began, I'm praying that he'll open this up to you in a way that makes a whole lot more well, not, not that it makes more sense, because it's pretty clear to me right now, but um, that you can get uh, in just a matter of minutes what took me uh, hours of prayer and agonizing and panic in the Holy Ghost. 
Amen. So I want to read out of Luke chapter 22 because this is, when we took communion, we read what Paul said to the Corinthian church to put them in remembrance of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. I want to read you what Jesus said in Luke chapter 22. I want to start in verse 15, reading out of the New American Standard. Jesus said this. He says, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall never eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Right from the very beginning, Jesus makes the connection between this last supper and the kingdom of God. And when he'd taken a cup and given thanks, he said, take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of this vine from now until the kingdom of God comes. I want you to clearly see the connection between communion or the covenant that we entered into or that Jesus entered into on our behalf on the cross and the kingdom that the covenant was there to establish. Does that make sense? Okay. And so when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way he took the cup and he said, this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Communion is the covenant that gives us access. It's the doorway, it's the gate into the kingdom. Okay? This will make a little bit more sense. I want you to understand that when Jesus said this to his disciples, had he gone to the cross? Did the disciples, the 12 that were around him, or the multitude that had followed him or experienced him over the previous three and a half years, did they have any reference on any level, any idea about the cross? When Jesus is saying, man, I have earnestly sought to have this Passover because I am not going to have this meal again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom. What do you think that the disciples were thinking? Remember just a couple of days earlier, Jesus is coming into Jerusalem and he's riding on the donkey and they are saying, Hosanna, Hosanna. They're laying down the palm leaves. They're laying down their, their robes. They're saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And Hosanna is save now. Save now. And guess what? Jesus was coming to save. He knew that he was going to the cross, but no one else did. They thought he's coming into Jerusalem. I mean, things had reached such a pinnacle that the religious leaders were saying, listen, if we don't do something about this Jesus guy, the Romans are going to come and they're going to take away our nation. It's better that one die for the nation than that we lose our kingdom. Okay? See, you need to hear that again. Because that's exactly what... See, when God says something, that's kind of like a verily, verily moment. You know what I'm saying? It's like if you hear it twice, you got, it's, it's meant to be heard. So thank you. That was, that was really, really good. Somebody's watching online and we're, we've got a little bit of a, of, a, of a delay. But Jesus is, is making a point and I want, you to, I want you to follow what I'm saying this morning from the mindset of the disciples. For the next few minutes, can we forget about the cross? Can, I, I want you to put it aside because the disciples and the followers of Jesus didn't know about the cross. It was a mystery that was hidden before the very foundations of the world. The Bible says that, that if the enemy, if the kingdom of darkness had even known about the cross, they never would have crucified the Lord of glory. 
They were getting ready to step into the, uh, a trap that was beyond anything imaginable. But I'm telling you, all of the world thought that Jesus was coming in to be crowned as king and to establish an earthly kingdom, to set up the throne. He was the descendant of David that was going to sit on the throne. He was the deliverer like Moses. He was the one prophesied about in the Garden of Eden who would crush the headship of the serpent. This is the one. This is the time. The entire crowd is in a frenzy about it. And so it's the next day. And Jesus said, man, we're going to do this Passover meal. So this is the mindset. So he's passing out the cup and he's passing out the bread. And he says, listen, we aren't doing this again until it's fulfilled in the kingdom. Yes, aren't you all saying, <laughs> come on. Bring it on. This is what we've been waiting for. Lazarus, Lazarus has been raised. Jesus has demonstrated his authority over, over Rome, over death, over sickness, over disease. Man, this is it. This is the culmination of the ages. Thousands of years of prophecy have been laid out for this moment. Here's the man, and we're sitting at the table with him. And he says, we're not having this meal again. Until the kingdom of God comes. Wow. Are you there with me? Do, have we rewritten the script in our minds so that we can have a framework to receive? Because when we read this, we, we just had communion. What were y'all thinking about? What were you thinking about? What were they thinking about? See, the cross is a stumbling block to the Jews, to the Greeks. There's something here. Both are right. That's the amazing thing. They didn't know about the cross. They didn't know about the blood. The cross is a mystery. They didn't see it coming. It didn't fit the paradigm. It didn't fit. So this last supper, this Passover, was the establishment of a covenant. Remember we read in 1 Corinthians, it says, this is the blood of my covenant covenant okay most people don't even know what a covenant is we've we've so watered down a covenant that we call it a contract because when you enter into a contract you enter into a semi-binding agreement with someone and unless they do something wrong and then you get out of the covenant right or get out of the contract but back in in uh the day that jesus was living I don't know, they might have had contracts, I'm not sure, but Jesus was entering into a covenant, a binding agreement where, where everything that was his, which is all of the kingdom, was, was being, through this covenant meal, was being, it's, it, it's being given to man. And in exchange, all that belonged to man, right? Which was what? Nothing. <laughs> Our sin, our sickness, our disease, our oppression, our being captive, our, our blindness. This is where Jesus is putting out the terms of the covenant, all right? The covenant is ratified on the cross. It's ratified on the cross, but this covenant is being established in this Last Supper, the what we call the Lord's Supper or the Passover supper. Are you with me? So the disciples didn't know about the covenant meal. The covenant is the gateway to the kingdom. It's not the kingdom itself. Okay? That's hopefully going to be a little bit clear. The covenant is how God transfers the power from King Jesus to the citizens of his kingdom, okay? The covenant, the communion, the blood, the cross, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection are all about our entering into a transition or a transfer of power from King Jesus to a new kingdom of royal citizens, priests and kings. Amen? The covenant is how that is. So let me just read you a couple of points. 
that I wrote down in no particular order, okay? Because I, I want to make a distinction between the covenant and the kingdom. Are, are you all, can you all follow me on that? I want to make a distinction between the covenant and the kingdom. Jesus, when he's having the covenant meal, he's talking, he says, I'm, we're not going to do this until, I'm, until the kingdom has come. Okay, so it's, not, it's different, all right? So the covenant establishes our relationship with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's the gateway into kingdom living. That's number one. Number two, the covenant focuses on the transaction created by the cross, the blood, and the resurrection. The covenant focuses on the unbreakable agreement through the cross, the blood, and the resurrection to forgive the sin debt and to restore man to his original created union with God and man's position of power and authority to rule and reign in the earth. The covenant ratifies our constitution as citizens of the kingdom. And the covenant is the event that seals a kingdom lifestyle for believers. Okay, you all follow that? I had to decide how much of that I wanted to keep and what order it was. But I just thought I'd just kind of throw it out there. So listen, the covenant, what I, I'm calling the covenant gospel, is for believers, not unbelievers. Okay? You go, well, why is that? Because an unbeliever is not ready or willing to enter into a covenant agreement. An unbeliever is not willing, they're not ready. They, when you enter into a covenant, it's a big deal. How many of you remember signing the, you know, the mortgage on your home? All right, how many of you thought that was a big deal? All right, you sweated it out. You said, are we making the right deal? I was talking to somebody the other day. We bought our home, I don't know how many years ago, 27, something like that. I remember when we first got married, our, uh, the, I'm going to give away our age, but um, we are, the, our rent in, in the first town home that we rented when we first got married back in 19, was uh, $220 a month. $220 a month. Was well, we bought the home that we're in now. I mean, that's, that's great, you know? My car payment's more than that <laughs> today. So we, we bought our home, and man, we were sweating because we were used to 200, 400. We bought our first home that was like $400 a month. Man, we bought the home that we live in now. It was, oh, we sweated. How in the world could we ever enter into agreement of somewhere around 600 and some dollars a month? Wow. For 30 years to commit to that, when, you're taught, when your mindset is like 200, 300, you're thinking, this is ridiculous. We can't do this. You know, if I'd had the foreknowledge to do this, I'd have bought like a dozen homes. <laughs> I'd have bought a dozen homes. I'd, 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 have, take, I'd, have, I'd, have, I'd have mortgaged I'd have everything that I've got. I would have done it. I would have done it. But when you don't know what you're getting into, there's some hesitancy. Why would an unbeliever want to enter into a covenant, a binding agreement with their life into a relationship with Jesus and they don't know him. They haven't experienced him. All they've done is they've heard a little bit of stories about him here and there. How many of you would hesitate? Okay. So the covenant is, is, is the doorway. It's, it, it's when you're ready. When, I mean, you've looked at the home. You said, man, I like this home. I want to buy this home. Now you're ready to enter into a contract. Now you're ready to enter into a covenant. But how many of you are ready, sight unseen, to sign a contract for a 30-year mortgage for $2,000 a month for the rest of your life right now, sight unseen, because I'm telling you this is a great deal? How many of you are ready? Come on. Serious. Why do we expect unbelievers to enter into a covenant relationship with Jesus? We tell them that Jesus loves them. We tell them that Jesus died for them. We tell them that their sins are forgiven. And guess what? We've got a timeshare in heaven that you can have, and it's already been purchased for you. All you have to do is enter into this covenant agreement. How many of you are willing to say yes? Huh? Nah. <laughs> 
You're fools if you do. You're a fool. And that's exactly how the world looks at the church today. When we bring them a message of the covenant instead of the message of the kingdom. You following me? Okay. This is a new lap around the bush for me a little bit. So God wants us to be effective witnesses for him. And so we've got to, we've got to preach the message that Jesus preached, right? So let me say this. A covenant is for believers, not unbelievers. It's like trying to get someone to buy a timeshare to the Diamond Sedona Summit. How many of you have wanted, can I sell a timeshare this morning? To the Diamond Sedona Summit, Charles. I told you I had a timeshare here this morning. Let me tell you a little bit about the Diamond Sedona Summit, all right? Now pretend you're an unbeliever, okay? And I, I want you, I know that I've, I've got something that's going to change your life. And really more than anything, because I've seen this, I've, I've been there. Actually, I haven't. I just looked it up online this morning. But I've experienced this, and I know. I, I love this place so much that I want to give you a free membership. I just need you to sign the document, okay? So let me tell you about the... Uh, Diamond Sedona Summit. By the way, if you do sign up, maybe I get a commission. I'm not sure. But anyhow, um, this, this is what it says. It says, Arizona is appropriately known for the beautiful Red Rock Mountains and the ultimate desert escapes. An oasis in the midst of the Arizona desert, you can find the Diamond Sedona Summit. This resort offers no shortage of breathtaking views as well as a breathtaking stay. Here you can find both indoor and outdoor amenities that satisfy your every whim. We can't forget to mention the six hot tubs found in the, at this resort, perfect for the ultimate relaxation. Sign up today. <laughs> we got one buyer there in the back, right? How many of you are ready to sign a lifetime contract for this timeshare today? without seeing it, experiencing it, or desiring, or getting to visit, or to use it until you're 80 years old. <laughs> till you're 80 years old. That is exactly what we do when we try to convince and convert an unbeliever to give their life to Jesus so that they can go to heaven when they die. Hello? I had to sit and think about this a little bit. Do you know how many times this is the message that I brought? We are trying to get people to enter into a covenant, to, which is greater than a contract, without experiencing the kingdom firsthand. Amen. That's right. This is the message that Christianity has been offering the world for the last 1,500 years. People need a three-day, two-night experience of the kingdom before we ever offer them the covenant. Hello? The world knows as much as we do. People need to have at least a three-day, two-night experience of the kingdom of heaven before, we're even, before we even have the wisdom to roll out the covenant the covenant of the cross, the covenant of the shed blood, the covenant of the forgiveness of sin, the covenant of the resurrection, and the covenant of, of heaven. It doesn't have a context to live in the mind of an unbeliever. And yet this is the message that the church has been proclaiming for 1,500 years. Wow. So... Trying to plug along here. What happens when you proclaim a covenant before you proclaim the kingdom? We tell people that Jesus loves them, forgives them, went to the cross for them. We try to sell them timeshares to heaven that they can't use until they die. We try to convince and convert them with no experience of the kingdom here 
and now. Come on, how many, how many of you know it's true? Okay. I wanted to go someplace else, but I couldn't this morning. Um, until people experience the kingdom, they are not ready for the message of the cross, the blood, forgiveness, and the resurrection. Yipes. You all with me? So you all either going to stone me or say amen one. I'm going to say it again. Until people experience the kingdom, they are not ready for the message of the cross, the blood, forgiveness, or the resurrection. We are preaching, listen, we are preaching the gospel of Jesus, but we are not preaching the gospel that Jesus preached. We are proclaiming the gospel of Jesus, but we're not preaching the gospel that Jesus preached. <laughs> the only message that the church is giving the world is a free invitation to heaven based on Jesus' love, the cross, forgiveness of sin, and the resurrection. The gospel of God's covenant is not the gospel that Jesus preached. In fact, Paul said this, he said that the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. We sound like fools to people in the world. 1 Corinthians 1.18, for the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. See, we, we focus on the last part of this verse, that the, power, the word of the cross, it's the power of God to those of us who are saved. That's why Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God unto salvation to those who believe. But to those who don't believe, it's what? It's foolishness. And why did God leave us here on the earth after we entered into the gospel of the covenant? The cross, the burial, the resurrection, the forgiveness of sins. Why didn't God just take us to heaven when we accepted the free gift? Because Jesus cares about lost people. He cares about lost people, and he gave us the same commission that the Father gave him. That we're to go to every people group, and we're to declare the gospel of the cross. The gospel of the forgiveness of sins, the gospel of the blood, the gospel of the resurrection. Come on now. Somebody say amen. No, this sounds wrong, doesn't it? But this is the gospel that we proclaim. This is the gospel I was taught. This is the gospel you were taught. We've got to go back and read what Jesus said. You know, it is so much easier to preach the gospel of the covenant because it relieves you and I of any responsibility of representing the kingdom in our daily life. It gives us a contract that we can offer to people that they will either accept or reject. And once we've offered it, we're off the hook and we go and we, we try to present it to other people. We are not representing the gospel that Jesus preached. Amen. Hello. Amen. Any of you hearing this for the first time? Maybe. No, you're not alone. God has been rocking my world. So again, the world didn't know anything about the cross. They didn't know anything about the blood. They didn't know anything about forgiveness. The resurrection, whoa. <laughs> you know, Lazarus had been raised not to, but that was a big deal. And they wanted to kill him too. <laughs> because they were, he was a representation of the kingdom of God. They didn't understand the resurrection until after it took place till after it took place. The message of the cross is for those who are ready to be saved, 
not for unbelievers. It's foolishness to them. So Romans 10 goes on and says this. Romans 10 verse 14. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? You see, they need something to believe. How will they believe in him whom they've not heard? They need to hear about the kingdom. They need to hear about, they need to hear the message that Jesus proclaimed, right? And how will they preach unless they're sent? Just as it's written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. You see, that's what we're called to bring is a message of good news of good things. We're not supposed to confuse people with trying to sell a timeshare to heaven that they can't use until they die, even though the price has been paid and, we've got, and we're experiencing it because we're on the inside. They don't get it. And the day in which we live today, they get it even less. The world that we live in today, people don't, unbelievers don't get it. They don't understand what it is that about these Jesus people. They're, they're always trying to get me to pray a prayer. This thing about going to heaven, I don't get it. They're weird, <laughs> you know? They think different. And there's nothing appealing about their life that would make me want what they have. There's nothing appealing about the, their life that makes me want what they have. Is that the way that people related to Jesus? No. Then there's something wrong about the basic message that we're proclaiming. Again, we've been preaching, we've been preaching the covenant. We've been preaching covenant. We haven't been proclaiming kingdom. Do y'all see the difference? Do you catch the difference here? Okay. It's not the covenant gospel. It's not the cross, the blood, the forgiveness of sin. It's not going to heaven. Again, we preach the gospel of Jesus. We need to align ourselves with the gospel that Jesus preached. Amen. Okay? So what was the message? What was Jesus' message? You already know because we've been talking about it, right? Mark chapter 1, man, from the very beginning. Mark 1, 14. Now after John had been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand repent and believe the gospel. John the Baptist, his message was repent. Repent means change the way you think. There's a new kingdom coming. There's a new king coming. Repent and be baptized because there's a new king that's coming. Man, the expectancy in the world just went way up. Man, there was a time where Jesus' disciples were baptizing more than John's, and they got upset. And the message that Jesus' disciples were giving was the same. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, is at hand. That's, that's the message. Don't think about the cross. Don't think about heaven. They weren't thinking about that. Everybody was thinking about good old Mo, Moses, right? They were thinking about the deliverance from slavery into Egypt. They were thinking about David. They were thinking about all of the great stories of the kingdom. And they were thinking, ah, we're living in this time. Ah, we get to experience this firsthand. Jesus. So, Jesus preached the kingdom of God. And he actually used the word in four gospels. He used the word the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven 122 times. 122 times. What was the proof? Oh, just by comparison, Jesus used the word born again twice in one conversation to Nicodemus. He says you can't see the kingdom unless you're born again. It's the only time that it's it's used. 
The word forgiveness is used 37 times, I want to say. Going to heaven, once. What was the proof of the gospel of the kingdom? Listen, wherever Jesus went, stuff was happening. Stuff was happening. Lives were being changed. Everywhere that Jesus went, people were experiencing the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. Listen to this. Matthew chapter 4, verse 23 and 24 says the exact same thing as Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. So Jesus was going around all of Galilee, teaching in the synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease, every kind of sickness among the people. And the news was spreading about him throughout all the region. And they were bringing people to him. Man, I'm telling you, when we're proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, you don't have to convince anybody of anything. When they have their three-day, two-night experience, and their lives are radically changed and transformed because of the experience that they have with a citizen and an ambassador of the kingdom, they will be begging you for the contract. Where do I sign? I'm willing to give it all. You're worthy of it all. They'll be singing. But they've got to experience. Jesus' message was the message of the kingdom of heaven. Mm. Why did the multitudes of people love Jesus, but they hate the message of the church? Because Christians focus on the covenant and Jesus focused on the kingdom. Now listen, I want to be fair, and I, I, I want to, with all due respect, the significance of the cross, the blood, the forgiveness and resurrection cannot be denied or surpassed. But their purpose is to bring you into the kingdom, not take you to heaven. Okay, I'm going to read that one more time. The significance of the cross, the blood, forgiveness, and the resurrection cannot be denied or surpassed. But their purpose, the purpose, the purpose is to bring you into the kingdom, not take you to heaven. We need to change our focus from covenant to kingdom in the world. Man, so Jesus in Matthew chapter 9 basically says the same thing. He went around all the villages and synagogues preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing every sickness, every disease, and news about him. Everywhere the kingdom goes, man, it, it's, it's just amazing when people experience that, that people share the gospel. You don't have to tell them. I always wonder, why is it that we share good news that isn't even good news to us? And if it's not good news to us, how in the world is it going to be good news to somebody else? It's this deep, esoteric thing that we can't quite comprehend that somehow or another by faith we have to believe because after all, we know that sometime in the next hundred years, we aren't going to be here in the flesh and we need a life insurance policy, right? And so somehow some people buy this fire insurance policy, they buy the timeshare, and then we live life for the devil. We eat, drink, and be merry because we don't have any evidence of the kingdom in our midst. So, <clears throat> when Jesus saw the multitudes, listen, wherever Jesus went, there was evidence. There was evidence of the kingdom. And when the multitudes saw him, when the multitudes came, Jesus was moved with compassion for them. Because they were like sheep with no shepherd. Jesus loved the world. 
The church hates the world. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. We want to send the lost to hell as fast as we can. We want to escape the world and escape seeing his kingdom come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven because it puts a demand on your life. It causes us to count the cost of entering into this covenant. Because the purpose of the covenant was to make you a citizen of the kingdom. Because when you become a citizen, Jesus told his disciples, he said, listen, when he breathed on them, he said, receive the Holy Spirit. Guess what? They were born again. That covenant that was, that was initiated in the upper room on, a day, on, on the Passover meal. Man, when Jesus was raised from the dead, it was sealed and he conferred citizenship up on the disciples when he was raised in the upper room, and yet he told them, listen, wait. Wait into, in Jerusalem until you're endued with power. Kingdom power, kingdom authority, because when you receive this dunamis power, the same power that raised Christ from the dead, man, when that power comes into you, you are going to do the works that Jesus did and greater works, and the world is going to explode and we will see a radical conversion of people because the Great Commission takes us back to the garden where God told Adam in the beginning, I have called you to rule and reign and to govern over the entire earth. And can I tell you, in the world that we live in today, there is only one force that is greater than the power of darkness, and that's the power of the kingdom of God. And that kingdom resides within his saints. And as long as the saints, as long as the saints are only residing within the four walls of the building, no one is experiencing the kingdom. Amen, and the devil says, you can have as much Holy Ghost as you want in the four walls of this building, as long as you don't take it out. Just Bring them in and have them pray the prayer and buy the timeshare. But remember, we were called to cultivate a garden. God called us and gave us the assignment to work. That's what we talked about last week. I don't have time to go over it, you know what I'm saying? But go back and catch some of these last messages since July 4. Because God has placed you where you work because that's your garden, that's your spot where you're called to cultivate his presence and develop a kingdom culture. Where you work, tell me it's not so. That's the gospel. <laughs> That's the, oh, but you can't preach. Well, listen, the place that you work owns the equipment. They own the car, maybe. They don't own your soul. And the moment that you compromise the kingdom, the moment that you compromise your character is the moment that they own your soul because you compromise the kingdom. We cannot afford to live that way any longer. So Jesus had compassion. There's a whole nother message, man. How we see people. How we see people. First of all, how do we see ourselves? That's what this is about. But then how do we see people? If we see people as the enemy, man, then we're, not, we're no good. We're no good if we see people the enemy. Jesus was moved with compassion because they were scattered like sheep with no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful. Can I tell you this? The harvest is plentiful. Amen. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. The, the laborers are few. This, doesn't, this isn't talking about quantity. It's talking about quality. He's talking about skilled laborers. Amen. Jesus, he's not saying there, there's not enough laborers. Man, there are enough individuals who bought the timeshare 
to be able to, to introduce the covenant to as many people as are willing. But we don't have skilled laborers who can proclaim the gospel of the kingdom in a way that people will be attracted to the kingdom and want to enter into citizenship in that kingdom. Y'all following me? Skilled laborers. Laborers are few, not in number, but skilled. If we are not sharing or believing the right message, we are not skilled laborers and we are doing more damage to the kingdom than good. If we're not preaching the message that Jesus preached, if we're preaching a different gospel, as valid as the covenant is, if we haven't prepared the ground, if we haven't sown the seed, if we haven't watered, if, if God isn't bringing increase, if people aren't experiencing the kingdom, then we are trying to introduce and get people to buy, to buy the Sedona timeshare that they don't get to experience until they're 80 years old or dead. And we are trying to convert and convince people to enter into a relationship and we are doing damage to the kingdom. That is not being a skilled laborer. Y'all follow me here? I'm telling you, this is not a message of condemnation, okay? To me, it's, it's, a, it's a message of awakening. Because <laughs> I, I looked at myself and said, man, what, what gospel have I been preaching? I've been preaching the gospel of the covenant for 45 years. That's all I've known. This is freaking me out. I hope it's freaking you out too. <laughs> <Exhilarating. laughs> In the most exhilarating, exciting way possible, right, Brian? So Jesus is literally saying this, stay out of the harvest field. If you are not skilled, if you don't have the, if we're not preaching the message that Jesus preached, stay out of the harvest field. You're doing more damage than you're doing good. You're turning people away. Listen, Jesus attracted the rich. He attracted the poor. He attracted children. He attracted um, prostitutes. He, he attracted tax collectors. He attracted Romans. Man, he attracted everybody. Everybody loved Jesus. Except for the religious people. What in the world? Religious people just want to sell timeshare. <laughs> Jesus wants to give people an experience of the kingdom and he needs skilled laborers. That's why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10 to the 12 disciples, he, he commanded them and said, listen, if you're a skilled laborer, the first thing that Jesus says is he tells you what not to do. If you're a skilled labor, the first thing Jesus is going to tell you is what not to do. So Jesus, these 12, Jesus sent out. Where is he sending him? He's sending him out into the fields. The, the harvest is plentiful. And he commands them and says, do not go to the way of the Gentiles. Don't go to the Gentiles. Does Jesus love the Gentiles? Yes. yes. Do the disciples love the Gentiles? Not particularly. No. Do not enter the city of the Samaritans. Does Jesus love the Samaritans? Do the disciples love the Samaritans? If the disciples go to the Gentiles and to the Samaritans, what message are they going to bring? You dogs? <laughs> you know, you heathen, you sinners, you reprobates. Jesus says, leave that harvest alone. You're not qualified. You're not skilled. As a matter of fact, in John chapter 10, when Cornelius had his vision, there was nobody that was willing to go into the Gentile. So Jesus gives a vision to Peter. He says, I'm not going to the Gentiles. You, you know these unsaved people. I, I've, I've never, I've never, I, I, I've never gone, I've never even had, no, no way. So he sees this sheet come down with unclean animals and stuff like that. Well, so so Peter reluctantly goes, right? He reluctantly goes. I don't even know what to say. I hate these people. I've never been into, into a Gentile home. But the Lord has showed me that I should not call anything unclean. And since the only thing I know 
is to tell you about this experience that we've had with Jesus. And guess what happened while he was sharing the kingdom? The Holy Spirit came in. And they were baptized. And guess what? A whole new crop, a whole new crop came into existence. And laborers were now being developed within Cornelius' household who would then be, become skillful laborers to take the message of the kingdom to the Gentiles. Y'all following me? I'm telling you. I'm telling you, I, I said, I threw this away about 6.30 last night. <laughs> 26 pages, and I'm going, I don't know where any of this goes. I think I'm just going to watch a movie. <laughs> God Almighty, help us. So don't go <laughs> to the Gentiles. Don't go to the Samaritans. You're going to mess it up. You're going to screw it up. You're going to mess it up. Stay away from them. I need skilled laborers. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Why? They loved them. They loved them. And then he said this, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received. Freely give. How did you receive it? Well, you received it by entering into a covenant. You received it by entering it Entering into a covenant. Now, people need to experience the kingdom by experiencing healing, being cleansed, being raised, being set free. You know, Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He's called me to set the captives free, to open the eyes of the blind, to proclaim, uh, to set it free those who are oppressed and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. That is the message of the gospel. The gospel is not the cross. It's not the blood. It's not forgiveness. It's not the resurrection. That's not the gospel of the kingdom. Hello. That's the gospel of the covenant. Jesus preached the gospel of the kingdom. Until people experience their three-day, two-night stay in the kingdom, they're not ready for the gospel of the covenant. Is the, is the covenant good news? Absolutely. On every level. And when people are ripe, guess what they do? They come to church. You know, just like the prodigal, you know, life got bad, spent time in the pig pen, time to go back to father's house. Father's house comes into the church, the altar call comes, he's at the end of his rope, he's ready. So he comes forward, right? Enters into the covenant. That's a whole nother message. But Jesus told, he told us to go out into the fields. He told us to invite people into the banquet. He said, man, go out and compel people to come in. I mean, give them such an experience of the kingdom that, man, they, they're just begging. They're begging to get into the kingdom. That's the way they were with Jesus, right? Okay, I'm going to wind this down. So, people need a reason to buy. <laughs> Time's here, right? People need a reason to say yes. Until people experience the kingdom, they're not ready for the message of the cross, the blood, the forgiveness, and resurrection. Yes. The multitudes followed Jesus. There was something magnetic about the kingdom. It appealed to everyone. Why is our message not received today? If you want to be an effective witness at work or anywhere, we best update our message to align with the gospel that Jesus preached. And his message was the gospel of the kingdom. We're trying to get people to say yes to Jesus for all the wrong things reasons. We want people to say yes to a covenant gospel without experiencing the gospel of the kingdom. When someone is ripe for harvest, you present the covenant gospel. It's the gateway to citizenship in the kingdom. I ran out of Time to put the rest of my notes together at that point. <laughs> I 
Jesus said that the harvest is plentiful. The harvest is plentiful everywhere you look. Listen, there is a harvest in your family. There is a harvest in education. There's a harvest in business, at work, in, in the economy. There is a harvest in government. There's a harvest. But don't go there until you're skilled. Don't go there until you're prepared. Don't go until you've got the right message because you're going to mess it up. You'll do more damage than good. There is a harvest in the media. There's a harvest in entertainment. In sports. There's a harvest there. These are the harvest fields that are in the world and each and every one of you are at work in one of those harvest fields right now. Now, how do we come to a place where we're experiencing the kingdom so that others can experience the kingdom? That's the question. Honestly, I think we need to wait in the upper room and pray until we get filled with the Holy Ghost all over again, you know. We need to wait for, for the sound of a mighty rushing wind to come and make such a sound that people are, thousands of people are gathering and we're forced to give a reason for the hope that's within us. Somehow or another, we need to pray that God begins to reveal this, not only the message of the kingdom, but the experience of the kingdom in our daily lives. There is no difference in 99% of believers. There is no difference in the way that we live our lives than the lives of an unbeliever. Why? Because we have not bought into the true gospel. And listen, I believe this message is going out throughout the entire church. I don't believe I'm the only one that has this message. I believe the Holy Spirit is releasing this into the body of Christ. Amen. And that's what our hearts, yeah. I don't care about people coming to the river. I want people to come into the kingdom. I want, I want this place to be a place of equipping. I want this to be a place where our eyes are opened, where we, where we see the truth and we, and, and we begin to practice developing a kingdom culture. And can I tell you what the kingdom culture is? The culture of the kingdom is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control oh that's the fruit of the spirit yes and if you are born of the spirit born into the kingdom we're supposed to be walking by the spirit and can I tell you this that the fruit of the spirit is the gateway to the gifts of the spirit the fruit of the spirit is the gateway to the gifts man we think well listen man if we, if we just pray for people and they get healed man they're going to experience joy and they're going to want to come into the kingdom no why not sow a seed of joy why not sow some goodness and patience why not sow the fruit of the spirit where you are and watch the kingdom grow Water, plant the seeds, water the seeds. You don't have to tell anybody about the gospel. They will be asking you. If the gospel is really good news, you don't have to beat people down to tell them what it is. If the gospel is good news and it becomes good news to you, whoo, man, tell me all about it. Tell me all about it. You see? But you know what? We sit around here and we're waiting to feel joy. We're, we're waiting. Well, where is this culture? It's within you. The kingdom is within you. You already have it. Can I tell you, you have as much Holy Ghost now as you will ever have. There's no more to give. You, we just have to learn how to activate what we've got. And the way that you, know, you want to know how you activate joy, you sow it. 
When you're down and depressed and you're in the mully grubs and feeling like life's going the wrong way, go find someone to sow some peace and kindness and joy into. And when you do, you will activate the fruit of the kingdom into the lives of other people and you're creating a culture. You're, you're creating the very environment where the kingdom thrives and where the gifts thrives. And man, it, it, it start, Jesus. do you think Jesus was in the dumps going about the Father's business? Oh God, gotta go work, gotta go out among all those sinners today. Open the eyes of the blind, cast out devils. Man, it was so much easier in heaven. We didn't have to deal with any of this stuff. And these people, they smell. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I don't like these people, you know what I'm saying? Oh, God. Nah. Jesus was the most joyful person there ever was. And the Bible says in Romans 12, it was for the, or Hebrews 12, it was for the joy that was set before him. Guess what that joy was? It was you. Coming into an experience and becoming a citizen of the kingdom. He says, it's, it's, listen, it's good for you that I go. It's good for, I'm entering into this covenant. This is a good deal. Because as long as I'm on the earth, Holy Ghost, governor of the kingdom, he resides within me. But if I go, guess what? Pff, this little light of mine, I'm going to spread it out so far and wide. I'm going to spread it out that, I, Jesus, I'm going to duplicate myself in every individual who becomes a part of my body. And everywhere you go, you'll do the works that I do, but you've got to do it with the same attitude I do. You've got to come with the right message. You've got to come with the right attitude. And man, when we do that, we're going to see. We're going to see revival. We're going to see awakening. Can I tell you, we need it in the world. The world is hungry for Jesus. The world is hungry for the gospel. They're just not hungry for the gospel that we've been presenting. We're trying to get them the contract before they've had their experience. Well, I'm done. I think we need to, to meditate on this, don't we? <laughs> I, Eric, I, did I send you some text last night? I said, Lord, I have no idea what I'm doing. I've got 26 pages of notes scattered here and there. Got up this morning, Holy Ghost, let's do communion this morning. Why do we even want to do communion this morning? It fits, trust me. Okay. So what we're experiencing this morning, listen, is, is, is a real life, real time expression, I believe, of the heart, mind, and will of God to see his kingdom come and for the church to embrace a message that we, we've let go of. I couldn't plan a message like this if my whole life depended on it. I'm just learning how to flow. I'm just trying to learn how to say what I hear the Father saying and do what I hear the Father say do. Are you all there? Are you all ready for that? Do you realize that, that, that this message has the possibility of radically changing your life? Radically changing the way that you represent the kingdom. Re represent is represent. We represent Jesus everywhere we go. And the harvest field is where you work. And there's so much more. Yeah, we'll, we'll pick it up next time. But um, are you up here for a reason? Just sitting? Just, just sitting? Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh -huh. What I would like to do is, um, I think I'd like to, to end by reading... Again, the, the disciples of Jesus had no idea. Remember at the beginning, they had no idea. When, when Jesus introduced this covenant, they had no idea about the cross. All they knew is that they had experienced the kingdom everywhere that Jesus went. Can I tell you, if people are experiencing the kingdom everywhere we go, you will have the opportunity to share about the cross, the blood, the forgiveness, and the resurrection. And people will be so so receptive, but we have gotten the cart miles ahead of the horse. <laughs> Amen.
Jesus said he cannot and will not come again until this gospel of the kingdom is proclaimed to all of the world. It doesn't matter how bad things get in the world until this gospel, the gospel that Jesus preached, until it's proclaimed, Jesus cannot come. I think Jesus wants to come. But he's long-suffering and patient, not willing that any perish, so he's waiting for his laborers to become skilled. And once we're skilled, and I'm telling you, watch out, world. <laughs> we're going to experience acts all over again. There's going to be so much joy. There's going to be so much, oh my gosh. You know what? I, I, I've said everything that I can say. I think we just need to see law and just kind of, just kind of marinate. This isn't a microwave message. This is one of those crockpot things. It is a lifestyle. Thank you, Brian. So I'm, I'm going to read this, and then uh, Eric, you want to come up and just close and lead us in prayer. And, I, and one, one thing I'd like to invite you, oh, uh, Chris, I'll let you do that. Um, after I read the scripture, you can come up and share, and then you can close. But I'd like to invite you, if you're, if you're willing, to take just a couple minutes and sit at a table. And I want, before you leave, I want to see if you can articulate in your words the difference between the covenant and the kingdom have you heard has the message been clear enough for you to be able to articulate the difference between the covenant and the kingdom you've got that's the starting point okay and i want to give you the opportunity to do that by sitting down with two or three people or you know if you're not comfortable you can do it husband wife whatever and if you're not clear please go back and listen to this again okay but i want to i want to read this um Jesus said this, again, I want you to think of this, okay, we're with Jesus, we don't know anything about the cross, so we're hearing this through the paradigm that Jesus shared it, and then somehow or another Holy Spirit help us to contextualize this into the world that we live today. And so he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall not eat it, uh, eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And when he'd taken a cup and given thanks, he said, Take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now until the time that the kingdom of God comes. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is poured out for you. It's the new covenant. It's the new covenant in my blood that opens the door, the gateway to the kingdom. Amen? Amen, Chris. Whatever's on your heart, buddy. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, yeah. The Holy Spirit's just been you now. He's been speaking the whole time because I think that was what we confessed up there. Holy Spirit opened, uh, you know, the eyes of my understanding within my heart. And um, so, basically, um, everything I came up here to share, Michael already covered it and confirmed it. Um, but there was one thing that um, I wanted to put a verse behind um, what he, what you just basically said verbatim, and it's in Matthew twenty four fourteen. If you guys want to look that up, um, and it says, "This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world." as a testimony to all the nations mm -hmm. and then the end will come so what the lord's been unpacking probably about three years ago now for me through this is that um he is creating the skilled laborers yeah. the holy spirit is training us and teaching us and guiding us and showing us how to operate within this um, and he's revealing this gospel of the kingdom um, which has been kind of buried and um, now is being un uncovered. So um, 
I, I kind of know what it's like to go in and out of it because it's, it's like, wow, that's been there all along and I just ain't seen it. Yeah. And, and I feel like the same way Michael is where you've just been operating in the new or in the old trying to get people to see Jesus without a life lived. Um, but all that's changing because this message is coming forth and it's going to get within the people, within the people of God. So, Amen. 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 Well, Father, I just ask you to seal this word in our heart. Lord, we repent for trying to give people the gospel of the covenant when they've not experienced the kingdom. But Lord, our hearts have always been because it's it's because we love you. It's because we love you. Father, I thank you for opening the eyes of our heart, removing the veil, and causing us to see with a clarity that perhaps we've never had before the message that you preached. Father, I pray, Lord God, that by your Holy Spirit that you will empower us. Lord, that you will visit us. And Lord, that you would be pleased to display your kingdom in us and through us. Father, I pray that that you will continue to teach us. Lord, I don't even know how to walk this thing out. I just know what you're saying, and I know it's a radical change from what I've known and experienced in the past. But Lord, I know it's time. And Lord, I know that the wind of the Spirit is blowing, and Lord, you are building your church. You are raising up a great, grand, end-time army that knows who they are, and Lord, that you're sending out into the harvest field because the harvest is plentiful. It's plentiful. They just haven't experienced the kingdom. And when they do, they'll flock to the church today in the same way that they flock to you. Father, cause us to see and to represent you in a way that the goodness and the mercy and the grace and the love that you have had for us when we were sinners. Lord, that others who are lost today would have that same experience. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, man, uh, I, I, again, I just want to provide the opportunity, the invitation to gather around. We call it table talk.